it's like I get so much energy from these conversations. I just want to start with that. Like between Catherine Zhao, Jeremy, and our exec ed team, it has been such an amazing collaboration. I think, you know, one of the things what I love about this work in particular that we've been doing together is one, we're bringing people together from all over the world, you know, people chopping in and we're like, whoa, and having amazing WhatsApp conversations. But I think what really enlightens and really inspires me every single time that I get on these calls is actually the, you know, very selfishly, I will say as a designer, the conversations that happen across domains. Um, as you know, our colleagues, Catherine, Zhao, and Jeremy, and Perry work in executive education. And so much of education is so siloed. We tend to stay in our lane. We talk to the same people in the echo chamber of our communities for good and bad reasons. And um, it is such a joy to learn across, you know, across domains, across content, because the more that we can do that, I think the better we are as individuals and the better we learn. So I just want to shout that to our executive education team who had this brilliant idea of bringing this together and doing this. And so without further ado, I'm just honored um, to invite onto the stage um, four of my dear, dear colleagues um, from San Diego. And we specifically chose four amazing people who serve in very radically different roles within San Diego because we thought um, that it's really interesting for us to remind that within each context or each community, People are approaching liberation, creativity, design in different ways. Sometimes we look beyond our neighborhoods. We have to go out. And yet it's sometimes it's really healthy to be like, down the street, they're doing something cool. How do we actually inculcate creativity in our communities? And we thought sharing from very three or four really diverse folks who are thinking about their work differently, but within the same context, serving communities across San Diego and hearing from them. So, um, I'm going to be do something that I actually don't normally do with my friends. I'm actually going to read their bios. Um, I'm actually going to read it because I want to make sure I get it right. And because they're such amazing people. And then we'll start with the, with the questions. We're going to have just about 30 minutes. I've got a few questions I'll pose to our friends. But as we go through, just like for those who have participated before, pop questions in the chat. Um, we're going to be sourcing them. We're going to be having conversations. So we'll pose some questions to them. But as you come up, feel free to throw questions and we'll try to incorporate those and of course address them at the end. So first up, I just want to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Kowaku Anning, who is the currently the director of the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurial Thinking at San Diego Jewish Academy. Um, he has had the privilege to work in various roles within public, charter, and private schools over the last 19 years within education. In his current and previous roles, he has had the honor to work with students on STEM projects, project-based learning that utilizes robotics, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, and projection mapping, which I really want to hear more about. Um, and then one of the highlights this past year in 2017 is when he produced four short 360 video documentaries for the United Nations on Fijian youth and the effects on climate change. So please welcome uh, our dear friend Kawaku. Um, and next up, we'll put in our friend, um, next up is our friend, Dr. Eric Shigela. Um, he is the founding principal of Vista Innovation Design Academy. Um, he believes all kids need a place to matter and that our actions say what we believe about our children and that schools have souls and those souls need to be nurtured. If you don't know Eric, he is a massive proponent of design thinking, runs an amazing program for a design camp and is really leading the world in how we can make design thinking joyful, fun, fun, but also really thinking about how we have the power, how we can use design to have the power to defeat or perpetuate the status quo within neighborhoods. So welcome our dear friend, Eric. Uh, next up is my colleague, Zoe Randall. Um, she is a positive, enthusiastic STEAM educator. Uh, she loves to spark creativity in others and helps them to discover her passions. Previous to working at San Diego Unified, she was a founding teacher of High Tech High. She is currently co-leading district-wide STEAM initiatives within San Diego Unified and writing TK35 curriculum on STEAM curriculums for educators across the district. And then last but not least, yes, she is a boss. And then last but not least, um, our, my dear friend, Mike Strong. He is the Director of Professional Learning and Curriculum at the Escondido Union High School District, as well as the founder of Blue Dot Education. 
Um, Mike has spent the last 18 years as a teacher and as a designer and a coach. His work in the classroom as an adult learning designer has focused on the benefits of PBL design as powerful cultures for promoting justice and joy um, within schools and internationally. So we could just give them a big round of applause uh, for all of them. <laughs> I know we have 19 hours right now. So I want to I want to um, hotlight, I'm going to start with my dear friend and co-running partner Zoe, who and I have run a few marathons together. And we're going to push it off to Zoe and then I'll let others chime in. The title of this session is called Liberation and Creativity. And if you're spending any time in education right now, liberation, justice comes up a lot. Equity comes up a lot. And I wanted to kick this question to you for you to think about what is actually liberation in schools really look like and sound like a buzzword, but what does liberation actually mean to you in your work? And if you could give us some examples of like how you define it and how does it show up in the work that you do? And we'll just start right off with, uh, with Zoe. Uh, ladies first, as they say, so let's kick it off with Zoe. Thanks so much, Laura. Thanks so much, everybody. It's so amazing to be here. Um, it's so important right now. I mean, for me, when I think about liberation, it's truly the number one key, I think, to why we are here in education, um, to free our minds, to free ourselves, to see our world for how we want to be. And, um, you know, I have the amazing privilege to work in the K-5 system at San Diego Unified and to be able to create a program that I hope and dream, um, along with my colleagues who are creating that along with me, uh, that we can set our students up for themselves to be curious, creative change makers. That's our mission. And when we think about liberating um, our, our future generation, our amazing youngest learners, and starting them with that idea that they can be who they want to be in this world they can be seen for who they are they can learn and discover their talents and brilliance and that we can nurture that and foster that in our educational settings i think that is our, our reason for being when we are we're doing the work that we're doing um, and that's really important for us so we do that really by creating a pathway for them to discover to dream to be creative um, to design uh, through STEAM, they are exploring the world as an inquiry based um, as themselves. And we start with science. And it's just incredible to think about how important every single child is in our system and how important it is to nurture their, their love for themselves, for others, um, and truly develop habits of mind that are going to get them there. So it was really nice to hear um, earlier the, the research. I'd love to dive into more of that. Um, and to, to see how that can definitely affect our, our youngest learners, so. So thank you, Zoe. I, and I think what I'd love to like kick the same question and I put it in the chat to our folks in here, feel free to respond to what you think liberation looks like in schools, but let's bring on Mike, our friend Mike and Kwaku jumping on stage and Eric. So one of you all, anyone who wants to jump on in, but let's, uh, what does actual liberation mean to you when you think about this within schools and the role that you have? And let's kick it to Mike. Okay, that sounds great. <clears throat> I was uh, actually on my way in to work this morning. I was listening to the uh, MLK Tapes podcast that's, that just came out. It's fantastic if you want a, a good listen. Um, I'm sad I have to wait for the next ones. Uh, <clears throat> there's a quote in there from one of the attorneys that kind of fought for this through the 90s. And he said, there's no justice without truth. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned justice and joy. And I think that in trying to design from a district kind of world, designing for nudged systems that are more just and more joyful. Um, one of the things that's impossible to do is, is get there without as many players as possible knowing the truth, <clears throat> the truth of the matter. And so um, in my role, that's been a really important thing for me. Uh, I spent a lot of time sharing my crazy ideas that, that hump, like I feel like a lot of mine are the goofy a lot of times, um, but I like to share that there's a thrift store actually behind that wall. There's a thrift shop. It's amazing. Um, but I go over there and I share it with the guys in the loading dock sometimes and just like talk to them because a couple of them have kids in our schools. 
Um, and I know one of the, the, the women who works at the checkout, her sister is the front desk person at our largest comprehensive high school in this district. And so going back and actually sharing and like digging for truth, like mm. what is the need? Who are we here? And, and how do we move forward based on that is mm. really, really important. Mm. That's great. How about uh, Kowaku? Let's kick it off. I mean, you think about this a lot, um, about what it means. And, and I love that Mike is talking a lot about like liberation, understanding the truth about really things as we think about what is the truth, what are, what truths need to be unveiled within our communities. And I'd love to hear a little bit about Kowaku as you think about this, as someone who has done um, a lot of podcasts with a lot of folks and thinking about <laughs> kind of creativity, as well as really bringing these liberatory mindsets. I'd love to hear what that means for you in your work. Well, it, I, 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 want, I want to agree with Mike, the idea of finding truth. And, and I think uh, my take on it is also, uh, it ties into perspective and the place from which you design from. Um, there, uh, whether it be through history, whatever, there are constructs, there are frameworks that we've come to think, this is what is good, this is what is right, and this is what is bad, and this is the process of achieving it. And I feel that liberatory design for students and for, for teachers, faculty members, even families, is how do I answer some of these larger questions getting beyond those frameworks? How do I look at a different approach to design that might not be part of, um, I, I would say maybe the uh, traditionally, um, I'm trying to find the right way to say this, what is considered correct based upon society, which is driven by what culture you're from, as opposed to what is correct, which is driven by the needs of the culture that you're working with or the people that you're with, or even borrowing from other cultures because there's so much magic and so much power in things that aren't lifted up as much as other traditional approaches. That's great. And then let's let's bring it back, uh, you know, Dr. Shigela, you know, you work as a, you're a principal. Um, and I know that you are constantly bringing design to your communities. And similar to many of us here, you work with young people from so many different places. And I'm loving your images all behind you right now about all the different images about like creativity, literally art right behind you. But what does that mean? What does liberation mean in your setting? What do you do in order to cultivate that mindset? And yeah, talk a little bit about what liberation actually means for you and your work. And then we'll, we're going to jump into a few more questions. Yeah, thanks, Laura. So like a little of our context is we're in a super poor neighborhood up in uh, the northern part of San Diego. And we we're brought in to reimagine a new hope for education um, at this very like downtrodden um, uh, school. And we use liberatory design, equity-centered um, human design and design thinking, you know, all kind of meaning the same thing in order to like root out what, what is happening here? Like why has the school failed this neighborhood? And so we, we dig into a lot of empathy work. You know, I like what Mike was talking about, like, you know, on the other side of this wall is the thrift store. We got a 7-Eleven. Uh, right on the corner like we even went to the 7-eleven we were talking to those guys like what you see a lot like you know way more than anyone would think so it's not just like talking to students and families but also like bringing in the community members so that we could really unlock the souls of the people here to liberate them in a joyful way um, because at least in California there are and it's very like you know high flute in uh, liberal leaning state there's so much systematic oppression that happens that school is done to kids and uh, what i find is the poorer the kids are the more that things are done to them less voice and so for us liberatory design has been like unlocking the hearts and the minds like finding joy finding joy but what we struggle with too is it can't just be for the kids that we're unlocking joy. And so what the project later that I'll talk about, Laura, is like we, we do a lot of talent development because in education, there's all these buzzwords, creativity, innovation. What the hell does all that mean? Like you have to define it and then you have to actually like be able to, the adults have to believe it and it has to ooze out of them because kids have a bullshit meter and they know when they're being uh, copped a lie. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep you on stage right here because I think you're actually going exactly to this question, which is, you know, as an educator, how? I think that's the question we all ask is like, well, this sounds great, but how do I do it? 
what's an example of a project that we can actually take on? And a lot of us in education, we read a lot, we read the stuff, but like, so let's just jump in and maybe, you know, we'll start with you since you're on stage and then we'll kick it maybe to Zoe um, after that. But like, talk about one of the barriers I think that you just mentioned is the mindsets we have. And in communities, there are barriers to doing creative work. Yeah. Right? Whether so like, like we're, we live in buzzword hell. <laughs> right. We say all these things that sound great, but they mean nothing because we don't interrogate and really understand the power of what they mean. And so when we tell um, teachers, you need to talk about creativity with your kids and they need to be risk takers and all these things, which are fantastic. But if the teachers don't actually know for themselves from their gut and their soul that they are creative beings, and that they can take risks. If, if they're too scared to take risks, but then you tell a kid to take a risk, the kid knows you're full of crap and nothing, there's no liberation there. Nothing happens, nothing comes of it. That's why we're stuck in these cycles of going and going and going with the same crap every single day throughout the system, which again, affects poor kids at a higher rate than anyone else. And so the, the project, like we've worked a lot on talent development so that the adults can see aspirations for their best future selves and they can open up and, and be vulnerable for that. So then they can actually genuinely have real conversations with kids who need those doors opened in their lives. That's what we're working. I love that. And I think you just need to mention a, a thing, idea of talent development, you know, and I think I'll just like, exactly, mic drop, like thinking about interrogating, like what this actually means. And I think you're on point. And I think a lot of us take this approach, and especially in learning, is that the adults aren't doing the work ourselves. How could we possibly bring this work to our young people and with our young people? And so all of you lead professional development. You know, Zoe's in the midst of transforming. Um, San Diego, for all of you who don't know this, the district, I think it's like one of the eighth largest districts in the country, right, size-wise. Um, and so I am kind of curious, this question you raised, Eric, about talent development. What do you do with teachers to help them experience this type of learning that we hope to see in classrooms? And Zoe, let's just kick it off with you and then we'll kick it back to some others. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's so right, Eric, like everything you're saying about what, how do we do this? How do we break down those barriers? And um, Laura, it has been my, I mean, amazing, um, this opportunity that I got to step into at San Diego Unified, where we have an instructional innovation team. And we actually have, I know, a shout out to Liz in the audience there, um, who has been leading this work as well. And our team is small, but mighty. And our team started with a small step. And that was to create a program that would help teachers unleash their creativity so that they could unleash it in their own students. And we started with our youngest learners in TK uh, through, um, we're making one grade at a time. So that's the other thing. We started with TK and then into kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and we are keeping on the steam train, <laughs> if you will. And um, little by little, we've been bringing our teachers along uh, because it is such a large district. We have um, a small group of schools that are part of this work that are starting to be the leaders of this work and then also trying to build leadership at those school sites. So really trying to scale. And um, really with our curriculum, it's project-based learning. Um, we started with NGSS science standards as a driver for that learning and creating design through engineering and trying to integrate everything, which really in our elementary schools here, um, especially we have the privilege to be able to have that space and time with our teachers and our students in one room all day. And it's a beautiful, ripe environment for innovation and creativity because when you're doing it um, and you have the time and you have the integration, the spirit of taking those risks together and taking the journey and building that with your students. Um, that is definitely the approach that we've been trying to, to do. And it definitely, like you were saying, Laura, it starts with teachers. If they can't liberate themselves, it's definitely not gonna happen in the classrooms. So it's been a lot of work to engage our teachers in that feeling that you, know, you are teacher's designer. You are also, designing along with your students and bringing them with you in this space to create. So 
that's def uh, that's what we've been trying to do, and um, we've been really excited uh, to see the results and and know that our students are getting the best education that they can. That's awesome. Let's hear from Kawaku. I know both, and I want to jump back to Mike because I do think this adult learning, this whole series, is about we as adults leaning into our creativity. And I'd love to hear both of you have worked in so many different settings about how what. I would love to hear from, you know, maybe Kuaku first about a really great example of how we do this with adults. What's the type of projects they're doing? What does the PD look like? What are the results of these types of professional development that you're offering with adults? And how does that transform them? What's the key? I'd say the, and one thing I know about Kuaku is he's a magic maker. So what's the magic sauce, uh, Kuaku, that you bring to your professional development to kind of cultivate these creative mindsets? Well, uh, magic sauce is, is really flattering. I will say this, uh, the, the, the redefinition of, of what right looks like. You know, we, I was having a conversation with um, the elementary school principal of the school that I work at, and I was talking to her about Family Circle, or Family Circus, Circle, whatever, those old comic strips. Some people might be familiar with them, you might not. They would have it, they would have every once in a while, they would have this comic strip where you would follow this long path of the student, and they'd go throughout their neighborhood and hit all these different stops, and then they'd finally make it back home. And we were having this conversation about how we need to get rid of the process of GPS learning, meaning what is the quickest way to go from what I don't understand to the right answer? Because that's not the process. We need to go on this long journey where we make a bunch of mistakes. We need to define the area that, we in, that we're in. So not only do we understand what is the right answer, but we understand what the wrong answer is and why that's okay. That, that creates the context for us understanding what the right answer is, as opposed to just saying, well, this is right. And this is what you have to know. And what we're hearing from all of our teachers is, you know, with fractions, all of our kids, they understand how to add fractions. They don't know why the answer makes sense, but they understand the, but they understand how to get to the answer, but they don't know what the answer means. And so a lot of the PD that, um, that we are setting up for our teachers, running for our teachers involve, how do we make you comfortable with being wrong? Because actually being wrong isn't being wrong. It's just defining the area that you're in so that you understand what quote unquote right is. And the more mistakes that you're making, the better it is. I love that. And I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it back to Mike because I think that's right. I talked to someone else is how do we move, remove? I think so much in education is predictable. The predictable answer is the predictable outcomes, like not only from a systems perspective, but a content perspective. We expect learning, we want learning to be predictable. And I think, you know, some of us move into uh, places in education where like our schedule is predictable, it feels safe. And I'm gonna, you know, kick it to Mike because I feel like he is probably one of the, the best teachers I know that creates experience where you don't know the outcome. You actually, it's really unpredictable. You're learning along the way and you've done a lot of, I'd love for you to speak a little bit about your current work but also speak a little bit about Blue Dot as well, about how you're kind of learning with adults and young people in areas that's never been discovered, you know, and we're area that's actually kind of on the cutting edge that's actually creating new content. Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about, um, about sort of like the, the omnivore's dilemma, that book from a few years ago about eating all kinds of different meals and what, what it means. And uh, I've been thinking about being an omnivore in terms of what happens during our very precious, and this year we have had so little professional learning time together. Um, and so it's, it's, it's precious. And so that was a little challenge for me. It's like, how do I not waste this time at the beginning of the school year? Um, and so we did this designing equitable learning a uh, couple of days symposium with all district um, staff. And it was really important. It was all certificated and classified staff. So we had everyone. We had every possible person in nutrition services was involved, custodial services is involved, our social workers are involved. Um, and we did some stuff designing what experiences could look like for students. But a little kind of hack that, that I built in was in our break times, I was like, well, break times, that's like the social time. But what if we use break times during a two day experience to gather some data. And so we made these um, really big, they're kind of too big, they're like five foot by five foot posters um, with these reflective recess prompts on them. So it was a recess, but it was meant to gather some data. And so they were simple, like they, these were five by five when we did them, but people went up and posted their name and it was just a heat map of like, where are you right now? Like, what are you thinking about right now? 
where might you be headed right now? And I saved them all. They're still rolled up actually back there in the corner of my office. And so that was the kickoff to our year. But then now where we are facing one of our greatest crises ever around, like we don't have teachers in classrooms, we're struggling with subs all year. I go back to that and I'm looking at the words from our teachers and that actually directly informed the next move on the sort of like district leadership end, which is, all right, let's solve subbing. Like, let's take our teacher effectiveness grant that most schools in California got, most districts got. Let's not hire consultants like people usually do. Instead, let's create a consultancy within ourselves with that funding so that we become the subs. We can build model teaching in and make sure that when we step into to sub, we can humanize that moment for the teacher who's out, whose child is sick, who has COVID, who's dealing with some loss or some need of some sort. Um, and so they don't have to like, rush to get the plans all together they don't have to stress about when they're coming back or not should i it's like no we got you we can cover it we will come in and do some model teaching we'll record it and bring in young teachers to watch and we're just hitting as many birds with one stone as possible in these times and i think this is a product laura of what you're saying like i didn't know what the need was at the beginning i didn't know where it was going to go and i don't know where this is going to go either i think that you know you connect into some of the work i've done outside of school districts with blue dot this is where design is finding its um, is finding its longevity and some of the work with some of the, the folks I've been able to work with is how do we engage in co-design that produces like that turns into a relationship. And that's all we ever wanted in classrooms was like my favorite time ever in classrooms was just hanging out with some kids. And now I get to go to their weddings and I get to meet their children and like these beautiful things happen on the other side. But how do we have the time invested because of design that we end up in relationships with each other. And so that work with a bunch of different schools and districts has been really exciting because we're learning from, you know, their loading docks and their 7-Elevens and how they're engaging with their communities and it makes all of us richer. I love that. And I think, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite our, our dear friend, Dr. Shigela, Eric, uh, back on because I think, you know, one of the things that you hold, Eric, in particular is being a school principal. And one of the things that's coming up in the chat is like the barriers, you know, I know, I, you know, one of the questions that came up is looking at like measurements and, you know, bringing culture, bringing creativity, bringing all these ideas of liberatory mindsets, adult PD, and yet there's test scores. There is actually like, you know, systems that you have to adhere to. And I am curious, you know, Eric, you've done such a successful job navigating creativity, liberation, and finding ways to actually you know, address, I think, some of the systemic barriers in education, which is they don't measure what really matters. And so I'm curious how you, you know, having been a successful principal for so long, have navigated these external barriers, these constraints that actually per actually prevent you from going probably your fullest liberation self. Um, and how do you navigate that, you know, and how do you work within the system or change the system to address some of these like system constraints that actually, I think, preventing some of our youngest folks um to really thrive in schools yeah i think there's this big thing with site administration especially like at the district level but even site people to understand the system so well that you don't mess up the system and the way we like to look at it is if we understand the system then we know how to leverage the system against itself and so um we do a lot of creative work around that you do a lot of design work and what we kind of have really found out is when we do the right thing for kids and we're servicing the adults in the right way to then for them to take care of the kids the test scores don't matter because that everything just kind of falls in line if you ask me what our test scores are i don't really know because nobody asked me because everyone's so happy and excited with what we do so we're we're a school of choice and we have a thousand kids on a wait list every year to try and get into this free public school and so once you start really like unlocking and we're, and we're not perfect. Like we are not perfect. I am, I'm, I have enough humility to understand that. But when things are going the right way to the benefit of kids in real genuine ways, then I think it unlocks other opportunities where people sort of like, don't worry as much. So there are schools in our district where they worry about test scores and test scores are looked at and there's those discussions. And it comes to us. It's like, you got a thousand people banging down the door. You're a political nightmare for the school board because everybody wants in, not enough people can get in. So we don't, we don't know what you're doing, but it's good. 
And so I, I and that was a, a jump off the, the side of a bridge for us. And originally, like when we talk about teacher vulnerability and talent development, when we opened, so we took basically a, a school that was ready for state takeover under No Child Left Behind. We turned into a school of choice, same building, same kids matriculating through, same staff. So nothing really changed except the approach um, towards looking at kids and opportunity and looking at how we do things. And there was this video we put together. It's fascinating. It was in our first year of the school. It was eighth graders who had been at the old school in seventh and sixth grade. And I thought it was a great video. They were talking about, and they were the toughest kids in sixth and seventh grade. And then they're like flourishing in eighth grade. And one of the things we did is we recorded them and we interviewed them and we showed it to staff. And I thought they'd be so excited. There were people crying. It wasn't like tears of joy. It was like hurt because there's this one student, his name's Omar. And he said, now our teachers care about us. And the teacher's like, F you, we've always freaking cared about you. But he was translating, the students were translating opportunity and experience and what they were doing in their classrooms mm -hmm. to care. Mm -hmm. And that like, that's a profound thing for us that, you know, state boards of education, even local boards of education, they're not going to get it or understand it. You just got to freaking do it. Like we told teachers our first three years, everyone's getting a perfect evaluation. Everybody. Because they had to, they, they referred to the evaluation system as a tool of tyranny. And so we had to get rid of it. And we didn't ask for permission for it. We just did it because it's the right thing at that time in our context. I love that, Eric. And I think it's like the realness of it is. And I think that's one thing that's coming up. And I love Mike's piece on like, you can't fake it, right? It's got to be legit. Um, Kwaku, I see that hand. Let's ju <laughs> jump in on there, Kwaku. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, I love the the comment that he, he uh, that Eric just brought up about um, the test scores not mattering. And I think the thing to really remember here, and I, I was hinting at it earlier, we lose sight of the forest for the trees. It isn't about it. it we are the focus of this is about helping these kids design a, a, a path in life where they can feel that they have meaning that they have purpose, that they are a part of society. And it isn't necessarily about what this test score is or what your teacher rating is, but all of, the, all of those uh, sort of hierarchies and all those frameworks force us to focus on the wrong things. And so when Mike's talking about the thrift store, which Mike, Mike has told me about like three or four times, when, he, when he's talking about the thrift store, you know, and when Eric's talking about the 7-Eleven, that is closer to what to what we need to be designing for the students along the, the lines of how are we creating a pathway for you to feel that you are meaningful and that you matter and then yeah. everything else everything yeah. else built on top of it, all the other catch words phrases and the technology all that fits into it but if they don't feel purposeful and they don't feel meaningful it, i to be honest I have no idea what my kids' grades are. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I am definitely not dads of the year, dad of the year. I have no idea. I, I have not looked at a report card in a good two to three years. But my goal every night when I talk to him is, hey, what did you learn today? What is interesting? What did you get wrong? Yeah. I beat him in chess all the time. And I always tell him, it's not about you beating me. It's about what you're learning from the loss. And I want to beat him. I mean... There's a there's a thing a question came about like how do we create that change in teachers when when they the, the culture of the teaching forces whatever it might be in a certain place and I think about that like when I was learning to drive in a stick shift and like you, like there's the idea of coasting right and it's super easy when things are flat but when you go uphill and downhill you really have to like figure it out and I think that the the sort of theme here of like truth telling looking next door checking the neighborhood that's like introducing like a social topography to what we're doing like this is what's real and we have to deal with it right like there's there's real stuff and i think that i do feel hopeful and i have faith that we have folks who really do give a shit they really do that it's just been calcified against them and over them and around them in ways that we have to introduce things that that do shake it up, disrupt, and and you know again like give some texture to what they're doing. Yeah, I mean one thing that's coming up for me, and I and, and knowing you all so well too, is like you give a shit. You actually do. I mean that's one thing that I definitely see a lot with you all is coming in and really caring for your folks. And I am kind of curious, you know, Eric, you've been at your school for a long time. 
Mike and Zoe, you're kind of moving into a district where you don't have those long standing relationships with the educators and the young people that you're serving. And I am kind of curious as you start thinking about, as you've been launching PD and you've been launching kind of new initiatives, how are you leading? Because if I'm hearing y'all correctly, like thinking about caring, thinking about meaningful opportunities, how are you doing that in such a way that actually lends truth, right? Not a just, hey, we're doing another PBL initiative where people sit back with their hands like this. How are you? And maybe we'll just start with Zoe. Like, how are you doing that with folks you're just meeting for the first time and bringing that in? A really good point, Laura. It's just, it's definitely been, um, you know, this is my fourth year that I'm starting and it's been a growing, um, you know, every day is, is changes and, and we had to go in with humility, with a where are you at uh, approach, with a who are you um, just lens and really uh, getting to know our teachers, what their challenges were, what their struggles are, um, what their hopes and dreams are, really starting with that. Um, and then building, because I think one of the things that really set us on our path and set us all free to do this work is because not only did we have um, trust and we had support in doing the work from every level of the system, but we also um, have been working to uh, build the trust through listening, through hearing feedback, through being responsive and learning from one another because we're not all um, complete experts at this. <laughs> we were we wouldn't be having this conversation, <laughs> but we are always open to learning. And I think having everyone's perspective and having everyone's um, just hearts in the game and, and trying to pull them in to why that's important and where their strengths and where their interests and where we can tie that back to the work and what what brought them purpose to being with their students um, just finding those relationship pieces and and trying to build from there has been really helpful and and also i think just calling back to what clock was saying about meaning making and really being in tune with like what matters asking your kids i mean what do you think <laughs> And hearing what they have to say was honestly, I was a substitute in middle school again. And it was amazing just to be able to hear, how are you enjoying your class? What is going on? What would you like to change? Ask some questions. Who are you? What do you like to do? And, and I think those um, just personalizing this and humanizing this experience for everybody is, is one of the ways that um, I try to approach this. I mean, and it's not surprising, and for all of you don't know, you know, Zoe's literally in a school because she's about to go substitute another class right after this. So when you think about like, I mean, in and of itself, literally, she's like gonna go teach in a second, even though she's not formally teaching in a classroom, she's going to cover a class. I mean, that in and of itself is, I think, as Eric said in his, um, you know, his bio, actions, like stepping in and actually doing this work. So I wanna, um, I know there's still questions in the chat. We've got about 12 minutes left. My dear colleague Jeremy has been like sourcing and Catherine as well. So we're seeing questions that are coming up. So I'm gonna invite, you know, Jeremy um, into the conversation because I know he's been, you know, crowdsourcing a bunch of questions. And I know he's been a better job of gathering those. So I'm gonna keep bring him on and uh, throw in some questions for you all. I don't know. I don't know if I, I've been so engrossed. I have yeah. to confess, I've hardly been keeping up with the chat. <laughs> I've just been riveted here. One of the, uh, let me, I'll scroll up for a second because I saw someone refer to D. Kolberhaus's question or comment, but I would, I'd put this comment to you all. This is something that resonated with me and it, and it got a little bit of traction in the chat. We can't begin to disrupt our organizations and institutions until we are willing to first disrupt ourselves, our own thinking and mindsets. And I'd be curious to know, just because the Masters of Creativity is all about showcasing you know masterful creative practice for the benefit of the practice of others and so i would say you don't have to uh, appreciate or accept the title we would confer upon you your masters of creative practice in this context as you consider imparting some kind of a practical mindset or tool to others who want to grow in this journey of mastery and you think about this question of disrupting yourself can you, can you tell about maybe a tool or a technique or a way you are deliberate about disrupting your own thinking and mindset? And, your, and maybe the last time you did that, just to make it really practical and tangible for folks who are listening and wanting to grow on the journey. 
That's awesome. And the smaller, the better, right? Like give us an example of something that is, that is approachable, I guess. Think if you could think at that level for us. I can give one example. Um, Every time someone asks me to do something that I feel uncomfortable with. And when I say uncomfortable, not like, uh, you know, um, like ethically, this doesn't sound right, but more, I'm not sure I can do this. I say yes. You know, Jeremy, perfect example. Jeremy asked me to write a, a blog post for his blog and I don't consider myself a strong writer. And so I said, yes, I will write a blog post for you. And it freaked killed, me out. He killed it. For the record, he killed it. I just want to say that he killed it. And I agonized over it. But what I realized a couple of years ago, and I'm going to give Laura, thank, I'm sorry. Thank you, Jeremy, for saying that. Um, I'm going to give Laura credit for it because Laura would constantly put me in these situations. Like, Quaffy, you could do this, right? I'm like, yeah, well, I don't want to let Laura down. So yeah, I could do it. Uh, <laughs> But what I've noticed is the more I say yes to that, and it's tied to this book that I've been reading uh, called Stealing Fire, it allows me to shut off my frontal lobe. We all have this voice inside of us that tells us that we're an imposter, so we can't do anything. So if we have this as adults, imagine what someone going through puberty is feeling, or imagine what a eight-year-old is feeling. And so if we can constantly put ourselves into that place of feeling uncomfortable, and come out on the other side of it and be like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Actually, maybe I do have this skill set. It's easier for us to take that spirit, that feeling, that creative confidence, as Jeremy referred to earlier, and impart that in classrooms or with teachers. And with teachers, it's a little trickier, but hey, what are you struggling with? Let's talk about that. What can I help you with? What's the thing that kids always never quite get that you want to teach? Let's work on that thing. You don't have to impress me. I'm here to support you. I was going to say something I I think about a lot is sharing the moment. So sharing the stage of the moment and sharing it with somebody who hopefully it's the same person can do both of these, but who is closer to being the user we're working for and who has less status than I do always and bring them into the mix. And the profound way that that actually shifts me from being somebody who's supposed to be the guy with the microphone in my hand and who's supposed to, you know, transform the moment or whatever it is, is, is massive. And the way that that often in a school district where things might be like kind of ingrained sometimes the way that that like D like like turns the temperature down on grumpiness or turns the temperature down on frustration when, hey, I was, I got the student who got in trouble for vaping in the bathroom and he's at the like, you know, program we have here at the office and he has something to share. Or the teacher who's been here for a million years and knows every intricate thing about this district, but has never been given a microphone and never really, you know, lifted up in any way. They've got something to to contribute here. It's, it's a really powerful thing. I think, um, I, oh, sorry, you go ahead, sorry. No, no, go for it. I was just gonna say um, for us, like really simply, and we stole this from High Tech High, is that models build creativity. And so teachers constantly like need to be pushed and provided um, good examples and models of what they can do. Um, and it's not just like in the classroom, like we want them to get out into the world. We want them to go explore other things. That's why like travel is so important for youth, right? And in and, and college and, and growing up. And then we do a lot of reflection work, like um, what brought you energy today? What drained you today? Uh, what did you learn about yourself today? And it's not just doing that reflective aspect, but then sort of what, like Mike was talking about, like, how do you share it? How do you talk about it and engage in growth from it? But we always come back to, to models help build creativity and we gain that in multiple ways. I love all of those. And I was just holding on to a clock to something that you were saying about just, you know, that trust and yourself and that belief that you might feel sometimes as an imposter, like you have to have the answers and, you know, be the person that, um, you know, other people see you, but that belief in yourself to be able to say yes. And <laughs> that, um, that also that nudge from friends and, and, people who are supportive of you and um, who have your back. And I I think that has always helped me try to do things that I also feel sometimes uncomfortable with. And I love doing new things. I honestly, I approach the world just by 
I want to do something uh, novel if I can. Um, I used to hold a list for my birthday every year, <laughs> just something, you know, okay, I'm going to do 33 new things this year. I'm going to do 34 new things, not, you know, all big, sometimes very small things. Like I'm going to go have dinner with a new friend or whatnot. But I just think like you hold on to the novelty that there's something more that we can continue to create and something that I love about all of this and and this amazing group of people gathered it's centered around creativity if we don't create the world we want to see. <laughs> then we won't see it so i'm just so um, energized by all of you and just feel so honored that we are all in this work together. That's beautiful. One of the things that uh, I'm just reminded of is I was in a Junto meeting yesterday with some close collaborators and the notion of optimizing for luck came up, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and to me, it goes, it kind of comes full circle in the conversation back to what we started with, with the idea quota and this idea of increasing variation and the principle being, you know, if you have the chance between going to a happy hour and Netflix binging, the, the, what we heard, what we were discussing yesterday was this notion of a good, a good selection criteria is which is going to enhance the possibility of luck the most. And I like that as a, as a serendipitous word for it. the way I interpreted it was what has the highest variability impact on my thinking um, and, and, and choosing paths, which to me, by the way, is the opposite of predictability. There may be things that deliver predictable outcomes um, which are maybe more expected. Then there are things and meetings and interactions and activities. And I love Zoe's example of try new things as an example of it's going gonna, it's gonna to increase variability. It may actually be worse. I may learn I hate cold showers or whatever it is, right? But guaranteed, if I'm optimizing for luck, there's this element of serendipity, of discovery, of unknown that's actually different from our kind of our conventional wiring and the conventional paradigm around predictability. So I just wanted to share that. I want to thank Laura for uh, facilitating this amazing panel. Can everybody put their screen, especially panelists, on gallery? If you put your screen on gallery, and I'd like for everybody to turn on their video if they're willing. If you're willing to turn on your video, please do it. And we're gonna give fireworks applause to our incredible panel. Fireworks applause. Yes, hopefully you can see that panelist. 